for those of you that do not know me, I'm not Garrett Evans. I am not from uh, Manchester and I don't speak as fast as Garrett. So I deleted some of his slides. His slides made it to here, but it's impossible for me to present 98 slides in 45 minutes. I hope you understand this. So neurofibromatosis comes in two flavors, type 1 and type 2. They're both completely different conditions, but they happen to be called neurofibromatosis, both of them. And if one is the most frequent condition, they're both autosomal dominantly inherited. And um, most of the symptoms in NF1 can be seen at the level of the skin, and you have a high incidence of uh, malignancy. Uh, NF2 um, has very few skin manifestations. Uh, diagnosis is made uh, later in life, and it has a um, low frequency of malignancy, and it's a low-grade uh, malignant uh, problem that you usually see. The genes have been identified for both uh, conditions, uh, NF1 on chromosome six, 17, sorry, and NF2 on chromosome 22. So um, NF2 um, is mainly characterized by swanomas. These are benign nerve sheet tumors um, consisting virtually completely out of swan cells. And they usually occur at the level of the vestibular nerve, and they have and the NF2 gene inactivated. In the general population, about one in uh, 500 individuals will develop a schwannoma. The diagnostic criteria for um, NF2 are known, and most uh, individuals have bilateral vestibular schwannomas, but you can uh, make a diagnosis in a case of a family history and a unilateral vestibular schwannoma, or in case of a family history or a unilateral vestibular schwannoma and any of these uh, symptoms here, or in case of multiple meningiomas and any of the two symptoms listed here. So you can make a clinical diagnosis in most cases. Um, this is from um, a registry in uh, Manchester where Garrett has been looking at um, the incidence and uh, prevalence of the condition and he looked at different uh, cohorts, bird cohorts, and then looked at the number of people that were present in this cohort with NF1, NF2 and schwannomatosis. So here you have the cohort with the highest incidence for NF2. So you can see that the um, diagnosis of uh, NF1 is made at a younger age than NF2. So 1 in 2,700 for NF1, 1 in 33,000 for NF2, and 1 in 69,000 for schwannomatosis. So you find the same figures here. So that's the birth incidence and the prevalence at a given moment in the population is listed here, 1 in 4,500 for NF1, 58,000 for NF2, and 125,000 for uh, schwannomatosis. Of the 32 cases with schwannomatosis in their register, they had identified 12 cases with the mutation, 6 LZTR1 and 6 SMORG-B1 mutations. So the vestibular schwannoma is the classical feature of NF2, was called previously acoustic neuroma, and it occurs in 95% of the cases on the superior branch of the vestibular nerve. You can see it um, very well on uh, MRI with gadolinium, and the growth rate is very variable from person to person, and also from uh, one side to the other side in the same person. Um, in a general population, the incidence is 1 in 80,000 uh, per year. So here you can see the two vestibular schwannomas, bilateral, and here also you can see both flanking the brainstem two vestibular schwannomas. Meningiomas are the second commonest tumor in NF2. They're predominantly cranial, but they can also occur at the level of the spine. 
And uh, cross-sectional studies suggest uh, more than 50% prevalence and the lifetime risk approach is 75%. There is a female predominance in number of meningiomas, but not in incidence of uh, meningiomas. And nowadays, uh, with the better uh, surgical procedures and uh, uh, therapy, medical therapy that is available, the meningiomas are probably the major cause of mortality. So here you see a graph with the age uh, at onset of symptoms in the UK series of more than 500 NF2 patients. And you see that uh, under the age of 10, there is only a small group of patients that show symptoms. And above the age of uh, here uh, 40, most individuals have symptoms. So in adulthood, uh, two out of three patients present with uh, vestibular schwannoma symptoms such as hearing loss, tinnitus, and uh, imbalance. But in childhood, the symptoms um, are different because vestibular schwannomas are usually not yet present and they might present with visual loss due to the congenital retinal uh, problems, a mononeuropathy, and skin tumors. So here you see an image of a skin tumor and here you see the uh, uh, reduced growth of the left hand and arm due to a mononeuropathy in a child. And only a minority of cases under the age of 16 present with vestibular schwannomas. So on uh, nearly 500 UK patients with NF2, you see that vestibular schwannomas, meningiomas, spinal tumors, and mononeuropathy ranked among, amongst the four um, highest uh, frequencies of uh, presenting symptoms or symptoms uh, in general. So um, if, you, if you look at 35 uh, individuals that are at risk of developing NF2, because NF2 runs in the family, you can do a sequential MRI uh, uh, of the head and see uh, when you detect uh, the first abnormalities. And here the age of 30 is quite critical because above the age of 30, there are very few that will still um, acquire symptoms or acquire abnormalities on MRI scan that were not present before. And um, if someone at the age of 30 has a completely normal MRI screening of the the, the brain and then the spinal cord, then there is a very small risk of 5% uh, that this individual uh, still will develop um, tumors uh, in, in, the, in the future. So this is interesting. If there is no mutation known and you follow up uh, children of someone with NF2, that you can tell them at the age of 30, now it's uh, quite unlikely that you will still uh, develop NF2, and also at that age you can tell them that it's quite unlikely that they will transmit uh, the disorder to their children. There are a number of genotype-phenotype correlations known for NF2, and the truncating mutations, they have the worst prognosis. Missense mutations, they have the mildest uh, uh, prognosis, uh, followed by large deletions. So in some cases, large deletions have a worse prognosis, but in, in NF2, the large deletions, they have a better prognosis than the truncating uh, mutations. And splicite mutations, they have a variable uh, prognosis, and they're worse when they occur at the five prime end. So here you can see that truncating mutations have the worst prognosis. If you look at the mean age of diagnosis and the mean age of symptoms. And when you look at missense mutations, they have the best prognosis. Also those who have an unidentified mutation and those cases where uh, there is mosaicism for the NF2 mutation. And here you can see that those with an unidentified mutation, they have uh, the same characteristics, more or less, than those who have a mosaic mutation, and these probably represent cases where the mosaic mutation was not detected. If you look at the mortality by mutation type, you see that the worst mortality occurs in this group, 
with the truncating mutations and the missense mutations are doing uh, better. And the other two groups are in between here. So the splice sites and the large deletion. You look at um, <laughs> the types of mutations in 740 classical uh, families. Uh, then it's important that you see all kinds of different mutations, also chromosome translocations, and there were six cases with the ring chromosome 22, which is relevant because we usually do not think of NF2 when we see a ring chromosome 22, but we all know as geneticists that ring chromosomes are unstable, so this creates mosaicism for uh, deleted chromosome 22, and if this happens in uh, swan cells, um, and if the uh, normal allele remaining in this one cell gets an NF2 mutation, you will get schwannomas too. So cases with ring chromosome 22 should be followed for um, signs of NF2. Uh, mutation analysis here is performed using different uh, technologies and also include deletion testing with MLPA. A mutation was found in 95% of uh, familial cases where, of course, in familial cases there is no evidence for mosaicism. Um, but in sporadic cases, a mutation was only identified in two out of three, suggesting that uh, maybe there is a good 30% of cases, uh, sporadic cases, that have mosaicism. And if you have tumor available for mutation analysis, you sometimes or quite often, more than 90% of the cases, identify the NF2 mutation in the uh, tumors. Also, if you look at 151 uh, families with uh, second generation affected, you have the same uh, detection rate of 95%. Uh, two out of six uh, missed mutations turn out to be deep intronic splice uh, mutations uh, that can only be detected if you look at the RNA level. And uh, uh, this is a technology that is used um, on a routine basis by Ludwin Messiaen from the University of Alabama in uh, Birmingham. So if you look at uh, NF2 mosaicism in the 917 individuals that had a de novo onset in, in the family, uh, 185 showed a mosaicism. Um, so this is between 20 and 30 percent, but in 56 percent of the cases, no mutation was uh, identified. Sometimes you see the mosaicism in the blood, but quite often you can find the mosaicism only if you look at the tumors. In older patients with NF2, you might see, as a chance occurrence, a bilateral vestibular schwannoma, because vestibular schwannomas are not, unilateral vestibular schwannomas are not so rare, rare in the general population, so you might once in a while see someone who has two sporadic uh, vestibular schwannomas. And approximately 25% of the bilateral vestibular schwannomas uh, over the age of 50 in people who have only vestibular schwannomas and no other features of NF2. So 25% of those over the age of 50 uh, might be due to a, a chance occurrence. Now, schwannomatosis. Schwannomatosis is a condition that is related to NF2 because here also schwannomas are the hallmark of the disease. So these people have two or more schwannomas and in general the um, cranial MRI scan does not show vestibular schwannomas and less than two meningiomas. And these people are negative for an NF2 mutation. In 2007, a family was identified with a smart b one mutation and schwannomatosis by the group of Theo Hulzebos from Amsterdam. And in 2014, 
the group from uh, Ludwin Michan from the University of Alabama in Birmingham identified LCTR1 mutations in uh, uh, families with, uh, with schwannomatosis and who are negative for SMARC-B1. Now I have to say that all three of those genes, NF2, SMARC-B1, and LCTR1 are localized on chromosome 22. So there must be something with chromosome 22 and schwannomas. And there is still a large group of families here that is not explained by mutations in SMARC-B1 and LZTR1, even in familial cases of multiple schwannomas, so schwannomatosis, you do not identify a mutation in any of these two genes. So if there are some young individuals present here who do not have a good project, this is one. Now, if you look at a large group of individuals with uh, LCTR1, you might once in a while run into a case with a unilateral vestibular schwannoma. And if you look at the group of individuals with a unilateral vestibular schwannoma and at least two other schwannomas, 7% uh, of these individuals had an LCTR1 mutation. None had a SMARC-B1 mutation. So even if there is a unilateral vestibular schwannoma, you cannot be sure that it has to be NF2 because LCTR1 uh, is still a possibility. So, conclusions about the criteria for uh, schwannomatosis. So, you need two schwannomas and no vestibular schwannomas on a cranial scan above the age of 30 then it's likely to be schwannomatosis, but it is not certain. Many patients with more than two schwannomas under the age of 20 will have NF2 and just did not develop the vestibular schwannomas yet. Or they might be mosaic for NF2, or they have no evidence of a vestibular schwannoma at 20 years of 20 on a scan. So NF2 as always to be considered. In schwannomatosis, you can also see um, cranial nerve schwannomas on other cranial nerves, not only on uh, the um, vestibular nerve, but also on the tri trigeminal nerve or other cranial nerves. And as I uh, explained to you, vestibular schwannoma might occur in schwannomatosis, especially in cases with an LCTR1 mutation. And also meningiomas may occur in schwannomatosis. Garrett has not seen plaque schwannomas or neurofibromas in cases with uh, uh, schwannomatosis, neither did I. And MPNSTs appear to be rare, but sometimes they occur, especially in cases with the SMARG B1 mutations. And SMARG B1 is a little bit specific uh, for this. I told you that. Both LZTR1, SMARC-B1, and NF2 are localized quite close together on chromosome 22. And there is this uh, very interesting observation that if you look in schwannomas, in multiple schwannomas from someone with schwannomatosis, be it SMARC-B1 or LZTR1, what you see is that there is loss of the normal chromosome 22 in these schwannomas. And in two different schwannomas, uh, you will have, in addition to the loss of the chromosome 22, you will have a mutation in the remaining NF2 gene. But this NF2 mutation is different in every schwannoma of a schwannomatosis patient. So you need to inactivate both SMARC-B1 copies and both NF2 copies. You do this by losing the normal chromosome 22 and mutating the remaining NF2 copy, and the SMARC-B1 copy was already mutated constitutionally. And the same phenomenon is seen in LCTR1. So if you have only one schwannoma to look at in an individual without a mutation in the NF2 gene in the blood, you will find a mutation in the NF2 gene in the schwannoma. It doesn't mean the patient is mosaic for NF2. It might well be that this patient has 
schwannomatosis. If you have two schwannomas, they both have the same NF2 mutation, then it's very likely to be a mosaic for NF2. So the revised Manchester criteria for NF2, bilateral vestibular schwannomas of, uh, below 70, the first degree relative with the family history of NF2 and a unilateral vestibular schwannoma uh, below the age of 70, or first degree relative and so on. But if uh, there is a unilateral vestibular schwannoma, uh, you need to have more than two non-intradermal schwannomas, and they both need to be, and they, uh, you need to exclude LZ tier 1 um, in the, the blood. So if you have a unilateral vestibular schwannoma and two non-intradermal schwannomas, it might also be LZ tier 1, it might be NF2. Then here, if you have a constitutional or a mosaic pathogenic NF2 gene mutation in the blood, that's fine. Or you need to have two identical mutations in two distinct tumors before you make the diagnosis of mosaic NF2. There has been uh, a lot of interest in targeted therapy uh, for benign vestibular schwannomas, and bevacizumab is one of the uh, drugs that has been used extensively over the last couple of years, and it was in 2008 that Scott uh, Plotkin uh, did the first experiments on treating patients with uh, bevacizumab, 5 milligrams per kilogram B weekly. Um, there were some side effects, but you could see a very nice result in, in some of these cases. So this is before therapy, this is after therapy. Um, so 10 patients were included in a study, and the median pretreatment annual volumetric growth rate was 62%. So they were growing quite aggressively. Um, and after bevacizumab treatment, nine patients showed a diminished uh, uh, volume of the vestibular schwannoma. Six patients had an imaging response defined as a shrinkage of more than 20%, and it was maintained over uh, many months, more than one year, in four patients. And the median, the median best response during therapy was a volumetric reduction of 26%. Four out of seven uh, who had measurable hearing uh, had a hearing response. Two had a stable hearing, and one had a progressive hearing loss. Now, there was a follow-up study um, that was published in 2012 with 31 consecutive uh, patients with also the same annual growth rate prior to treatment of about 70%. Um, and also here you can see that uh, many of those patients responded um, to therapy. So the overall response rate was 54%. So about half of the tumors of the vestibular schwannomas had a shrinkage of 20% or more during a therapy. And the median time to response was three months, so you see it quite uh, soon. Then Garrett prepared a nice presentation on the uh, experience in the United Kingdom on bevacizumab experience um, with Oxford University Hospitals, Cambridge University Hospitals, uh, Manchester and Guy's and St. Thomas from uh, London. So they treated patients with um, vestibular schwannomas with bevacizumab um, every three weeks and then maintenance therapy from uh, six months uh, on where they reduced the doses. The median duration of treatment was 21 months and uh, at this moment 53 of the patients are still on drug treatment. So a radiographic response was um, uh, when they saw more than 20% decrease from the baseline uh, volume. And a hearing response was also um, measured. 
Here you can see that about 40% of the tumors in their series achieved volumetric response, meaning shrinkage of 20% or more, of which 35% of the target vestibular schwannoma, that's the vestibular schwannoma that caused most of the concern, and that was the reason to start treatment, and 40% of the contralateral vestibular schwannoma that was not the target for the therapy had a shrinkage to of uh, more than 20%. And also here, it was a median time to radiographic response of three months. There were a number of uh, adverse uh, events noted, but most were grade one or grade two, and there were very few grade three and grade four uh, side effects. So here you can see uh, a patient with NF2 who was uh, treated, this is before treatment, you see here on the uh, nerve uh, roots here, different tumors uh, that extended into the uh, spinal uh, canal. And after about one year of therapy, you see that there was a massive reduction in the volume of these tumors. This is another one showing a large intraspinal uh, tumor here of uh, 10 centimeters that uh, post-treatment shrunk to 8.5 uh, centimeters. And this is also a nice graph from uh, uh, Garrett's uh, clinic in Manchester where you see the steadily increase <coughs> in uh, surgery for vestibular schwannoma over time meaning that they had always more and more patients with NF2 that came to their clinic. And then you see a dramatic decrease um, when they started to use bevacizumab, and now they're here at a steady state level, uh, but taking care of many, many more patients than before. So it reduces the, the need for surgery, and it can also postpone uh, the need for surgery. And also, as you can see here, um, they have been implanting less brainstem implants and cochlear implants because of uh, hearing loss than before and taking care of more people with <coughs> NF2 than before. And here you see over time the increase in survivor curves. And the most recent curve here is the blue curve from uh, 2010 with... Uh, with bevacizumab. So at this moment they have uh, used the drug in 106 individuals. In 22 they stopped uh, treatment. The median age was 25 and the median follow-up was 30 months. And these are the numbers on Avastin in the different um, uh, hospitals and the percentage of cases that they are taken care of and are being treated with Avastin per center. Then NF1, we know the diagnostic criteria for NF1. Um, we know the typical cafe less spots, they are present um, uh, already in the first year uh, of life and are very easy to recognize. So it's a simple uh, condition and a simple disease to, um, to diagnose. And there are a number of tumoral complications that make it worthwhile to make a diagnosis at a, at a young age. And this is from uh, the uh, registry in, uh, in Manchester. You have this juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia that occurs uh, usually in very, very young uh, children. There is very small lifetime risk, but nevertheless, it's uh, very important to <coughs> diagnose it. Pheochromocytoma, optic pathway glioma, <coughs> other gliomas, and then there is uh, a quite high lifetime risk of developing a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. And as you can see here from this uh, graph, the um, survival of patients diagnosed with an MPNST after five years here is, is quite low and drops still about 30% of those that were diagnosed five years before. So the uh, prognosis of uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors in NF1 is, is, is very bad. And there are a number of screening settings now offered with whole body MRI and so on 
to pick them up uh, early on. Now, one of the studies that has been done in Manchester um, was looking at all different kinds of uh, cancer risks in patients with NF1, and they identified uh, an increased risk of breast cancer in women with uh, NF1, and especially women uh, below the age of uh, 50. So they had uh, 14 cases where they expected only four with a standard incidence rate of 3.5. Uh, and most of these cases uh, occurred in a, in a young age group. Then there were several other studies here published that find also an uh, increased incidence of uh, breast cancer in, uh, in women under the age of 50 who had uh, NF1 here, here. And also here. And then the latest study is a Finnish study um, where they found 31 cases of breast cancer in the whole Finnish population with NF1 um, with a relative risk of 11 in, um, in women under the age of 40. And the standard mortality rate for breast cancer was 5.2. And the five year survival was poorer in patients with NF1 versus the general population. So it's important to recognize this and to offer screening in uh, women with NF1 below the age of uh, 50. And then, uh, still have a couple of minutes, I think. Yeah, I'm doing fine on time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's the RNA-based uh, NF1 mutation analysis. Mm -hmm. um, from the Manchester laboratory. This type of mutation analysis was pioneered by Ludwine Messian when she uh, still was at the University of Ghent in Belgium and uh, she moved more than 10 years ago to the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And uh, this is the same kind of uh, principle to look at um, cDNA instead of uh, genomic DNA. So if you look at two different groups, a group who fulfills NIH criteria but not only based on cafe less spots and axillary freckling, so not only based on pigmentary uh, features, but also non-pigmentary criteria like Lish nodules, scoliosis, pseudarthrosis, neurofibromas, uh, optic pathway gliomas. Then you have group one. You can have both familial and sporadic group one cases. And group two is a group of uh, uh, individuals below the age of 20 who have only uh, six or more cafe less spots, uh, plus or minus freckling, but no other uh, features and no family history. Uh, I apologize for the colors. I didn't choose the colors. I hope you have your sunglasses with you. So in the familial cases, um, Using this RNA-based technique, they identified a mutation in more than 95% of the cases. Also, in the de novo cases, who fulfill the um, criteria, not only the pigmentary, but also at least one non-pigmentary criterion, you have 95% of cases that were identified with this technology. And those that were identified only by looking at the cDNA is about 10% of those cases. If you look at the sporadic cases who have six or more cafe less spots, then only in 66% of those cases a mutation was identified. So some of these have either another condition or they might show mosaicism for the mutation which is not detectable in the peripheral blood. And here there are a number of examples of these uh, RNA-based uh, mutations that were difficult to identify or could not be identified uh, with genomic um, analysis. Here you have a deep intronic mutation. Um, there is another deep intronic mutation here. Uh, there are, is a complicated mutation here and so on. And then even a number of uh, mutations that were detected in the coding sequence, like these variants of unknown significance, either missense or synonymous, they turned out to trigger 
abnormal splicing, as did a number of nonsense mutations. Now, looking at those with a clear pathogenic um, mutation in the group of uh, patients less than 20 years old with six or more cafe less spots and no other um, non-pigmentary criteria, you see that those with a clear pathogenic mutation were 62 percent um, based on RNA uh, or cDNA uh, mutation analysis, uh, you pick up another 8.5% with the spread one mutation uh, in both groups, both genomic and cDNA sequencing, but you can reduce the likelihood that it is still NF1 by RNA-based uh, sequencing from one in nine to one only in six if you use only DNA-based uh, testing. But a number of these cases definitely have mosaic NF1. And in those cases, you can only find a mutation if you go through the painstaking effort of uh, growing melanocytes from cafe or less spots. But not a lot of people are so uh, uh, masochistic to do that. Then treatment options for NF1. There was this very interesting publication in Cell in 2008 on imatinib where they show this image and everybody thought, well, you know, plexiform neurofibromas that size that uh, shrink uh, over a couple of months by treating with imatinib. That's the holy grail we were waiting for. But then a follow-up study, a phase two trial showed only a slight reduction in, in most cases and usually the smallest tumors had the best response. So it, it's really not uh, very interesting to treat uh, plexiform neurofibromas in NF1 uh, children with uh, imatinib. Then statins that penetrate the blood-brain barrier uh, showed uh, dramatic effects in, in improving the learning deficits in NF1 mice. This is uh, work from Alcino Silva's group. So people started to uh, set up uh, double-blind uh, studies in humans and there are two studies published now that are essentially negative. We cannot recapitulate this finding in humans. But now there is a MEK inhibitor that showed some effect. And um, NF1 um, is sitting here. It's a negative regulator of RAS. And one of the uh, phenomena that we see is that in the tumor, the normal NF1 allele is inactivated. You have a hyperactive RAS signaling with the hyperactive MAP kinase uh, pathway. And so MEK inhibitors here block the MAP kinase pathway at this level here. And in a mouse model, this showed uh, promising results, but as I told you just a minute ago, uh, you cannot always transfer data from the, from the mice to humans. For some reasons, humans uh, are not mice. Then uh, in December of 2016, there was this interesting publication in uh, New, England Journal, New England Journal of Medicine by the group of Brigitte Wiedemann from the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda. And they treated a number of uh, children with growing uh, inoperable plexiform neurofibromas and uh, looked at uh, the, their results. So there were 24 children between 3 and 18 years of age. And in 71%, they show a partial response to treatment and a partial response defined as a decrease in volume of 20 or more percent and no disease progression. As you can see here, they use three different dose, dosing schedules. They are very similar to each other. And here you have a number of cases that are treated where you can see the uh, shrinkage of the tumor after starting of the treatment. But as you can see in some, there is some relapse over time and the tumors start growing again. But this is the first time that there is some consistent finding of a response in the majority of plexiform uh, neurofibromas uh, to a specific drug. So in the neurofibromatosis community, this is very exciting and other uh, NF1-related tumors are now uh, being uh, treated or started to being treated in, in trials to see 
if others, uh, other tumors also react to this uh, drug. Now to conclude, NF2 and schwannomatosis are separate but linked conditions. Uh, NF2 is characterized by bilateral vestibular schwannomas. You don't see this in schwannomatosis, but unilateral vestibular schwannomas can occur in LCTR1 related schwannomatosis. But NF2 is much more commoner than schwannomatosis, and Avastin has been shown, so the bevacizumab has been shown to work in both conditions. For NF1, it's important to know that women clearly have an increased risk for breast cancer, especially below the age of 50, and we need to devise a screening strategy for these women. And MEK inhibitors are really very important in the, in the NF1 uh, community. So I thank you well, for your attention. Well.